I'd like to take you with me a few years back to a tragic moment I've experienced, a blind date. That actually was not the tragic bit about it. It only became tragic once she came in the picture. When the date stopped being blind and I could actually, we could actually see each other, I loved what I saw sitting in front of me. Yet when we got to the talking stage, that's when it became a bit difficult. He asked me for my musical taste, who was I listening to, I said Britney Spears, but instead of giving me his favorites, he gave me a very nasty look, followed by a very nasty sentence that said, I don't get how any woman beyond puberty age with a good education like yours can actually listen to this crap. So that was more or less where the date ended, but his words remained mainly because it was not the first time that I had such a reaction to my musical preferences. Pop music, and by pop I mean the generic term for popular or mainstream, has always been my way of making sense of the world. And for the past 14 years, I've researched the correlation between pop music and social behavior, and I came to realize that pop music can actually foretell commercial behavior as well. And it's one of the most accurate maps that we can use to forecast trends. So let me show you an example as to how it works. Open Gangnam Style. Gangnam Style. Op, 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 op. In 2012, Gangnam Style ruled the American charts on his way to becoming the number one most viewed video on YouTube of all time with nearly 2.5 billion hits. Now, at the exact same year, six out of the ten leading pop songs on the American charts were of non-U.S. artists. Why does it matter? The following year, a research done by the Pew Research Institute based in Washington, D.C., realized that more and more Americans are now viewing the global power and prestige of the U.S. as declining. So what the success of Gangnam Style and all those non-American songs on the American charts were telling us, even without the Pew Research, was that now Americans are willing to let foreign influences dominate their cultural markets. And what works in music works in other industries as well. And Uniqlo, the Japanese retailer, those same years grew stronger and stronger in the U.S. on its way to outgrow the traditional American brands such as Gap and Old Navy that normally dominated the American market for affordable and basic clothing. So how come my eye-pleasing date from a few years back did not get it? Let's look at some of the biggest pop songs out there and see what's not to get. Let me read out some of their lyrics for you. Baby, 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 you. I'm sure you know this one. And for those among us who love glorifying the past, here's another one. Wake me up before you go, go. Don't leave me hanging on like a yo-yo. Right, so you get that. Here's the thing. If we want to be able to use pop music as a trend forecaster, we have to look beyond the lyrics. And instead of trying to understand what meaning the artist or the songwriter gave the song, we need to look at what meaning the listeners are giving to the song. Because a song can only become influential once it is appropriated by others. And there are two key elements here that turn pop music into the powerful social barometer that it is. The first one is the power of the mainstream as a validation mechanism. And the other one is the power of pop songs as ideological messages. Let's start with the mainstream as a validation mechanism. In the world of trying to forecast commercial behavior, we normally would look at the fringes and try and guess which fringe element is going to become mainstream, and based on that, we'll start making predictions. But this is actually quite hard to do because not only do we have to guess among almost an infinite number of elements, of fringe elements, but we would also need to guess by when that transition will take place. So we're going to work in an environment with a lot of unknowns, and our ability to be precise is going to diminish. But if we look at mainstream music, on the other hand, and try and make predictions based on that, we'll be much more accurate. 
And here's why. A fascinating research from 2011 by the Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute found that once 10% of the population adopt a certain idea, a new idea, that idea is necessarily going to become the new convention for the masses. So that means that once this 10%, this threshold, this minority mark is reached, and a new idea, a new behavior, a new attitude is on its way to become mainstream and therefore influential. Mainstream music, by virtue of being the music of the people, music chosen by the majority, necessarily represents ideas and norms and values that have already passed this 10% minority mark and are on their way to make an impact. So based on that, if we make predictions, we're going to be much more accurate looking at the mainstream. And here's what happens when you don't listen to the mainstream. This is what happened to Starbucks and how they lost millions of dollars. In 2001, Starbucks very rightfully recognized the vast potential of the Israeli coffee-consuming culture. And they opened six branches across the country. They shut them all off two years later and never came back. Why? What went wrong? This was the Israeli musical psyche towards the end of the 1990s. I'm sure a lot of you recognize them. High Five, Israel's biggest boy band, my all-time favorite. Completely constructed and exploited by the record companies, just like anywhere else in the world at the time. High Five and similar musical acts of the same time very accurately reflected what Israelis felt towards the new millennium. They wanted to be perceived as liberal, advanced, embracing the prospects of globalization. But that psyche completely changed once the millennium was here. And here's one of the biggest songs from the beginning of 2000. <laughs> Right, so already completely different, right? National symbols mounted, there was a revival of folk culture, and the new psyche was about accentuating the local, necessarily at the expense of the global. And that was the exact time in which the symbol of globalization, Starbucks, entered the market and failed. Had it entered a few years earlier, a few years later? Had it adjusted its messages to adhere to a growing national sentiment? That could have saved them millions of dollars. And all it took? Listening to a few pop songs. So now that we've seen the power of the mainstream as a validation mechanism to new ideas, let's look at pop songs themselves as ideological messages. We should look at songs as capsules containing ideologies and worldviews. When we listen to a pop song, we hear way beyond the song itself. We may hear tastes in fashion, attitudes towards gender and racial issues. We may hear stands about politics. So it goes way beyond the music itself. We may hear it through the lyrics, but more often we're going to hear it through the musical genre chosen, through the singing style, through the visuals associated with the video or a specific artist, or through the, the fan base that a certain artist or song managed to gather. Think for a second of your own favorite music and how closely linked it is to different aspects of your life. It could be to the way you're dressed, to the people you're associated with, to your stand on different social issues, or even to your spiritual preferences. Right? Rap music, for example, is known worldwide as rebel music, counterculture music, giving voice to the underprivileged. So in this respect, our musical preference serves as one of the best psychographic tools out there, providing penetrative insights into our thought processes and into our behavior. Indie music, very similar to rap music, also has a very clear ideology attached to it. So when indie music started becoming mainstream towards the end of the 1990s, it was clear that now the ideology surrounding indie music is on its way to make an impact. In fact, it became so disruptive that it influences current agenda in Silicon Valley and the entire tech world. 
Indie music, or independent music as it was initially known, referred to music that is not associated with the big record companies. But very quickly, indie music grew to become the soundtrack of the hipster sound culture, calling for you know, the ideology of leading a more conscientious, sustainable, more lives. So shopping in second-hand stores, eating vegan, that was all part of that ideology. When indie music picked in the mainstream, this is what it sounded like. These are the British Mumford and Sons. And this song is highly influenced by bluegrass music. Bluegrass is a genre of American folk music, very closely linked with nature, with the great outdoors. And by incorporating that type of music, indie music was now going way beyond the music. And it started coloring our minds, our belief systems, and our urban spaces green with trends such as urban farming, very similar to the way rap and grunge painted them concrete gray back in the 1990s. In 2012, the same year in which this bluegrass-influenced music picked the charts, the food tech companies of Silicon Valley managed to raise $350 million and to lure in some big names such as Bill Gates to become investors. And that number grew by 37% each year since. So I guess that had I wanted my date to last a little bit longer than 20 minutes, this is what I should have started my music conversation with. So pop music, in spite of sometimes getting some bad reputation, is really one of the most accurate and user-friendly tools out there with which we can forecast commercial and social trends. And celebrating curiosity over judgment, the next time that you run into a teenager, or anyone beyond puberty years for that matter, loving Justin Bieber, Taylor Swift, Nicki Minaj, don't act like my close-minded date did, though in retrospect I am very happy he did. But don't disregard or dismiss their taste, but rather remember they are simply early adopters, listening to changes in tastes and attitudes and ideologies that are going to affect you too because depth always has a shallow surface. Thank you very much.